why don't we go ahead and get started and people are welcome to come on as, as they come. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to the Nanet's uh, virtual programming, the importance of net research and how to apply. My name is Dr. Lauren Fishbein. I am an associate professor in medicine and endocrinology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And it is my pleasure to moderate today's interactive panel discussion on the importance of neuroendocrine tumor research and how to apply for grant funding. This uh, webinar is co-hosted by the NANETS Continuing Education Committee and the Scientific Review and Research Committee. And I just have to say that a grant from NANETS actually jump-started my research career in neuroendocrine tumors, so have to put that little plug in here. Um, each of our panelists will give a brief presentation, and then we will engage the panel and the audience in discussion. Next slide, please. NANETS is committed to increasing diversity within our activities and structure to reflect all aspects of the neuroendocrine tumor community we serve. We strive to cultivate an open, transparent, and supportive culture where all are welcome. We encourage members to contribute and participate fully. For more information, please visit the website at nanets.net. And now I would like to recognize our Scientific Review and Research Committee co-chairs. Dr. Halperin will speak about the grant application process at the end of the slide deck after the panelists speak. So, uh, oh, excuse me, back one slide, please. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Daniel Halperin is a, a chair of the Scientific Review and Research Committee. He's a medical oncologist and clinical investigator at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. And Dr. Christopher Heafy is the co-chair of the Scientific Review and Research Committee. He's an assistant professor at Boston University School of Medicine. So I thank them both for being here with us. And now let me introduce our panelists. Next slide, please. We have four panelists uh, who will speak to us today briefly about their research that they're working on with grants from Nanets. First is Dr. Renata Stuhl. She's an assistant professor at the University of Alabama. She will talk about her NANETS Basic Translational Science Investigator Award on novel antibody drug conjugate for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor targeted therapy. The second speaker will be Dr. Julie Halle, Assistant Professor of Surgery at the University of Toronto. She's an Associate Scientist at SUNY Brook Research Institute and Adjunct Scientist, ICES. She will be speaking about her NANETS Clinical Investigator Scholarship Award on patient reported outcomes and care delivery for neuroendocrine tumors. The third speaker will be Dr. Tom Hope, Associate Professor in Radiology at University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. He will be speaking about his NANETS Theragnostic Investigator Award on optimization of intra-arterial Y90 Dodatoc PRRT. The last but not least speaker is going to be Dr. Irene Min, Principal Investigator at Wheel Corneal Medicine in Dr. Zarnagar's lab. She will speak about her NANETS Young Investigator Award on analysis of immune microenvironment in targeting metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Next slide, please. This is really intended to be an interactive discussion, and I will engage the panel with some questions. And feel free to comment in the chat box, I post a question there. And when we get to the Q&A at the end, um, you're welcome to unmute and speak. But until then, please mute yourselves unless you are speaking. All right, with that said, let's get started. We have the first speaker, Dr. Stuhl. Take it away. Um, good afternoon. So my name is Renata Stuhl and I'm assistant professor in the Department of Surgery, uh, uh, Division of Breast and Endocrine Surgery at, at UAB. And I received over two years ago um, NANET's um, the Basic uh, and Translational Science Investigator Award um, for the project to investigate antibody drug conjugate for uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine uh, tumor targeted therapy. Next one. Um, so using, the, using this funding, um, we have constructed um, three tissue microarrays. Um, probably it was about, it is about um, 60 patients. 
And um, what we confirmed that about um, 70% of um, neuroendocrine pancreatic patients are positive for SSDR2 um, expression. Um, next one. Uh, we also confirmed that um, SSTR2 is specifically expressed on the cell surface, which is very important for um, um, targeted therapy. Next one. Uh, we also um, validated uh, available um, pancreatic neuroendocrine cell lines for SSTR2 positivity. And to do this, um, we used, um, we, we checked um, uh, SSTR2 level um, on message, uh, on protein. Then we looked at the um, uh, cell membrane uh, positivity. And also we quantified um, SSTR2 comparing to normal um, healthy cell lines. Next one. So the antibody drug conjugate um, consists of antibody and drug. And first, we validated if um, uh, our antibody is really specific um, uh, in in vivo model, uh, especially for bone xenografts um, transplanted uh, subcutaneously. And uh, what we found that um, this antibody really specifically binds to those xenografts uh, when um, antibody is labeled with fluorescein or with, or with uh, zirconium for uh, an image uh, and uh, PET scanning. Next one. So in the next step, we evaluated um, payload. And in this uh, ADC, we used um, potent uh, cytotoxic drug, MMAE. And we confirmed that this drug indeed um, uh, induces cell cycle arrest, induces apoptosis, and what is most important, has ideal structure to conjugate with antibody. Next one. And then finally, we, um, we perform um, uh, in vivo cytotoxicity uh, study. And um, by injecting um, IV, this, this ADC, we found that um, this antibody reduces significantly tumor growth without um, uh, significant um, side effects. Um, next one. Uh, based on this finding, we were also able to develop um, um, 3D ex vivo uh, preclinical model for culturing human pancreatic uh, tumors in, in bioreactors. And we are now um, in, in a time when we validate this, this model. Next one. So based on this, th those findings, uh, we were able to publish four manuscripts uh, um, that happened at all four in the last year. So we published in the cancer gene therapy, in pharmaceutics, in surgery, and in uh, biotechnology journal. So it was um, th this, this uh, amount of data uh, uh, from this grant was, uh, was very, very fruitful. And we were able to, to accomplish four manuscripts for, uh, for, from this grant. Next one. And um, what is most important, actually this um, NANET grant helped me to, um, to submit and received my first NIH grant, which first was scored at eight percentile at that time, the pay line was 7%. Uh, percent. So um, after resubmission, we received 3%. And um, of course, it was um, uh, funded. And also, um, based on this study, we were able to, uh, um, um, to file a patent for SSTR2 antibody, because we also made own antibody as commercial available especially for in vivo study, is extremely expensive. And um, we have also patent for um, this antibody drug conjugate. But I really want to emphasize that um, the NANET grant helped me 
to obtain my first uh, MA in trending um, with, with excellent score. Next one. So I really want to uh, thank especially my mentor, um, Dr. Herb Chen, and also my collaborators, um, Susie Lappi, um, Jonathan McConathy, and Margaret Liu, and um, all my lab members. Thank you. Wonderful. That's so amazing to have four papers published last year from this work, and then a third percentile in the grant is wonderful. So congratulations on that. Um, thanks for your talk. Our next speaker will be Dr. Julie Halle, and I'll turn over to her. All right. Thank you very much for uh, for this invitation. So I'm going to try to cover a bit of the work we've done, but also sort of focus on what made this grant successful, both in grant capture, but also um, in terms of the work that we've done, and, and go towards this like. Um, advice towards uh, writing grants moving forward. So similar to the, the story that's just been told and what uh, Dr. Fischbein said at the beginning as well is that uh, the Nanets grant was really one of my first peer-reviewed grant that, that kickstarted my program in endocrine tumor research. It allowed me to get my first CIHR peer-reviewed grant, which is the Canadian equivalent of the NIH um, that has a, a a success rate of about 15% of proposals that are funded. Um, so really that made all the difference uh, to be able to do all this work and, and build my, my program for the future. And those are the four things that to me are most important uh, when we look at uh, what makes a grant successful beyond having a good research question and, and rigorous methodology. There is a lot that goes around the grant and I'm gonna try to see how um, we did that with this one. So the first thing is building um, the story or sort of the elevator pitch. Um, everybody here is an American tumor fans if you're part of Nanets, uh, but I, I've had to practice this pitch and, and convince uh, reviewers that it was the most important thing to study ever. And uh, my partners and colleagues are now quite tired of hearing me talk about it, but essentially here it goes. Uh, even though neuroendocrine tumors are, you know, traditionally considered rare diseases, their incidence has increased more than other cancers in the past um, decades, over twofold uh, here in Canada. And uh, the majority of those patients will experience metastatic disease, whether at diagnosis or through the course of their cancer journey. But despite having such a high rate of advanced disease, those patients have really prolonged survival, up to 40% at 20 years for all comers in Ontario. So when we put all of this together, um, you know, it's not surprising that you have increased incidence, prolonged survival, and your endocrine tumor is now the fourth cancer in terms of prevalence. More common than gastric, pancreatic, or esophageal cancers that are better known. And it really is a chronic cancer. And with chronic cancer, patients living a long time with active disease, there is your opportunity for a lot of um, debilitating aspects for patients, for society, and for the health system. And with this disease, we have no standardized care pathways at this time and no standardized supportive care. So this is the gap that we're trying to fill with the research we're doing right now. Um, those are the three objectives we had, which um, are self-explanatory from the title, but essentially looking at patient reported outcomes who are vulnerable populations in terms of receiving care and support with neuroendocrine tumors, and then put all of this together to build a framework that will improve patient-centered care for neuroendocrine tumors. We're doing this work using unique data sets um, at ICS. This is the ICS building and, and Bernie here has been waiting for data for quite a while um, recently. But um, basically all administrative healthcare data in Ontario is housed at this institute and we can link it uh, to study uh, different disease types, including cancer. The, one of the key I think with this grant was having a very good team and combining different expertise. So we had strong clinical and health services research um, people on the grant. We also have qualitative methods researchers so that we have different methods to reach the objectives and then a strong support for epidemiology and biostatistics for a rigorous uh, approach. And then a lot of those members also hold uh, sort of very important stakeholders position in cancer care in Ontario. Uh, Dr. Singh is the, who most of you might know, is the lead for person-centered care in Ontario. Dr. Law is the regional vice president for cancer services in Ontario and Dr. Coburn, uh, the lead for patient reported outcomes. And finally, Dr. Wright, uh, right here is the um, surgical oncology lead for quality uh, and safety. 
And so beyond those stakeholders, we're also um, very careful to involve patients and citizens in this research so it has a maximum impact. And so we use this IHR framework for citizen engagement. We also um, used, oh, I lost access, sorry. We also used, uh, sorry, the patient and service users engagement framework. And I think that that has been one of the unique things about this grant that make it so strong uh, was the participation of patients through partnership with uh, CNETs. Oh. And so we have input from the, the beginning to the end of the, the research work. And this is how we've conceptualized our knowledge translation. And I feel like this is often something that's missing from a lot of grants. Um, so that, that's how we've approached it. Uh, different activities, and this will all be combined in something called zebrazone.net, um, which will be a hub for neuroendocrine tumor information to um, disseminate the work and gather feedback on it. So just very quickly, some of the things we've done with this work, uh, we've described the symptom burden of patients after diagnosis for neuroendocrine tumors and realized that there is chronic unmet needs uh, when we evaluate this objectively with validated scores. We did the same at the end of life and identified a steep increase as the uh, death nears for neuroendocrine patients. So again, some unmet needs in this area. We then looked at using different patient-centered outcomes and traditional survival and recurrence outcomes to assess treatment delivery. And one of the treatments we looked at is the resection of primary tumors and metastatic small bowel neuroendocrine and identified that those patients have better experience in terms of going back to hospital when they get resected early on. Finally, we looked at some factors in terms of vulnerability in neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, for example, we were interested in knowing whether there is increased um, psychiatric diseases in patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Sorry, I cannot advance the slides anymore. If you could go to the next slide. All right, it's back. Um, and so saw that there's Sorry, I'm not sure what's going on with the slides here. Okay. In short, we didn't see any difference in, the, in psychiatric uh, illness in patients with neuroendocrine tumors. And so now what we're doing to put all this together is we're actually getting a lot of this data uh, to patients and to focus group conducting qualitative interviews in Canada, the US and Australia to see how we could uh, use all of this to implement um, facilitators of shared decision-making and, and patient-centered care uh, in our clinics. And so this is some of the work that we're gonna do uh, next, um, including, <laughs> including reviewing all path, I'm really having issues, um, including reviewing all pathology data um, in Ontario and adding that to the data sets we have, which will uh, really increase the, the power of the analyses that we can conduct. And um, so that's a bit of what uh, we've done with our team and really grateful again for Nanette's support. I wouldn't have been able to do any of this uh, without this, uh, this grant. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much for sharing and congratulations on, on your grant that has come from this initial work from the Nanette's grant. So thanks, thanks again for sharing. Um, all right, so, um, oh, it looks like we unshared, great. So. Uh, Dr. Tom Hope is up next, and uh, I don't know if he has screen share capabilities or if Nanette staff will show. There we go. You guys got it. Every hand? now and then things work, right? Yeah. Your turn. Take well, it thank away. Thank you so much, Lauren. And uh, it's been really exciting to hear the previous talks about how much has been accomplished and really highlighting how uh, these grants, which in all honesty, in the big picture, things are small, can have a huge impact. So. It's really wonderful to see that happen in so many people's careers and the same in my career as well. So these types of projects, which seem small, can really drive people down the path of becoming participants in neuroendocrine tumor research. And uh, hopefully I'll be some, somewhat of an example, but you know, maybe not as much as our prior speakers, because that was a really an, an incredible accomplishment showing. So I uh, received a grant to study uh, intra-arterial PRT uh, and how it can be used in the setting of neuroendocrine tumors. And we use yttrium-90 dodotoc, uh, and which is a, a different radio ligand than lutetium dodotate. It, it's a 
the Y90 decays by giving off a beta particle. It has a longer path length. So it, it sort of can be more effective, but also potentially more toxic. And so this was the literature uh, that was available when we started our project showing that when you gave an intra-arterial administration of gallium 68 dota talk, you got a much higher uptake in the tumor. So arterial administration directly into the hepatic artery seemed to result in much higher uptake in tumors when administering gallium 68 dota talk. And this had, you know, nearly a two and a half to threefold increase of dose. And so the idea was if we were to give yttrium 90 intra-arterially, that would cause higher uptake. And maybe you'd only need one dose of treatment instead of needing two to three cycles, which is what you would normally give with yttrium 90 dota talk. So we ran a study where we gave yttrium 90 dota talk, and then we actually followed them up after a single administration uh, but what was interesting about this study is we also did a imaging study the day of treatment. Uh, when So we actually administered gallium-68 dotoc along with the yttrium-90 dotoc simultaneously and compared that to a preceding intravenous administration of ga gallium-68 dotoc to see how the uptake and biodistribution changed with the intra-arterial administration. And, and that's a really important distinction was that we gave them along with or in tandem with the therapeutic administration instead of being on its own, meaning an arterial administration of gallium dota talk without the therapeutic administration. Now, there's uh, some people to thank here, and particularly the University of Iowa. This is really a great example of collaborative sharing. Uh, University of Iowa shared with us and let us reference their IND for yttrium 90 dota talk, which really without that, that would not have been possible. And, uh, through other granting mechanisms, we built up this facility with this synthesis module where these doses were created. We actually created a custom made acrylic shielding to put the therapeutic vial in so that we could transfer it to the patient, et cetera. So a lot of work went on on the chemistry side to enable this research. Uh, this is our the IND, uh, the paper version of it. Uh, thankfully, now uh, the FDA no longer requires uh, paper administration or submission of INDs to save a couple of trees for every IND that's submitted. But at the time that this project was done, we had to print up uh, thousands of pages and submit it. And this is our uh, synthesis area where we do the gallium labeling. Uh, so to highlight what was sort of interesting here is we had the therapeutic vial over here, but also we had the gallium vial. And so we co-administered both at the same time to the patient, uh, which allowed us to see, again, that change in biodistribution with the arterial administration compared to the intravenous administration. And so here is Colette, one of our nuclear medicine technologists in the OR. And you can see, again, one pump pumping in the therapeutic vial here, another pump pumping in the, uh, the gallium dose simultaneously through the catheter that's going into uh, the patient's inguinal femoral catheter here. And you can see the catheters, but obviously not showing the patient. And this is was sort of quite a setup to actually get to work. Now, look at some of the results. So this is a common thing that we saw in patients. So uh, the IV administration, when we gave intravenous gallium dota talk is on the left here. On the right is the intra-arterial administration. And you can see how everything sort of went down actually. So for the spleen went down in uptake, uh, the extra hepatic disease went down in uptake, and even the disease in the liver had a little bit of decreased uptake relative to the intravenous activity that's administered. And it's sort of an interesting observation. And probably what's happening here is we're actually uh, binding all of the receptors with a much higher mass dose of the intra-arterial administration that is tandem with the therapeutic dose. So you're actually saturating the receptors, causing overall decreased doses. In this patient who had a very high volume of disease, you can actually see in this patient, you actually had about a 50% increase in dose to the liver lesions with maybe a 20% decrease in the dose to the extra hepatic disease. So getting a little bit of targeting, but it's much more muted than we saw with that literature I showed in the very beginning when you gave the dose arterially with the imaging dose only, because you have a much smaller administered mass dose. So we're actually muting the impact of giving it intra-arterial because we have receptor saturation. So overall, this is sort of looking at box plots of IA versus IV. The hepatic tumors actually had a lower dose than intra intravenous, and the extra hepatic tumors had even a lower dose. So there is some benefit of the arterial administration. We're getting a muted 
a decrease with the arterial administration for the hepatic tumors. And then the other involved organs, the spleens, et cetera, have an even lower dose. And this is all examples of how receptor saturation is happening. And this here is in essence showing this change in size of liver lesions in patients after treatment. So time zero is a day of treatment. You can see the single dose of yttrium-90 dototoc really is not adequate in controlling disease as a single therapeutic dose. And so we need to really convert over to using lutetium uh, and doing multiple cycles, uh, et cetera, because the, the single IAY90 therapy isn't really as therapeutic effective as we had thought going into this trial. And then this led to our paper that got published actually just this year in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine. And as I got across, hopefully, you know, the team here is really important and most important is your main collaborators and mentorship. And I'd obviously like to point out Dr. Bergsland. Dr. Bergsland wasn't present of Nanette's at the time that this all started a number of years ago, but without her guidance, you know, I was, I was pretty young to say the least, and I'm still feeling young uh, when I started this process. And really she helped design the trials, uh, understand patient selection and how to run this and think about it and make this actually successful moving forward. And there's a large number of other people who are involved in this research projects from technologists, CRCs, uh, the nuclear medicine physicians who helped, interventional radiologist Nick Fiedelman who did the procedures, et cetera. So thank you all very much and I appreciate the opportunity. Wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing your work and congratulations on your paper that came out and uh, very interesting, interesting work. Okay. Last but not least, we have Dr. Irene Min, who is going to share uh, some of her work from her NANETS grant. So take it away. Uh, thank you for, uh, thank you for giving uh, me the opportunity to speak here. Um, actually, so my uh, grant was uh, called the Young Investigator, uh, and young meaning not really, uh, <laughs> not uh, young, but actually at the time I didn't really have much experience in the neuroendocrine research, uh, but it actually gave me an opportunity to join this endocrine surgery division that was actively doing research and I uh, applied for this grant and uh, from the, through this grant I was able to contribute uh, to our findings and hopefully we we're able to uh, publish these findings in different papers. So um, to the, go to the next slide please. So um, one of the most significant uh, prognostic indicator for PNED is the extent of the disease and the metastasis. And um, the survival rate uh, for the patients uh, drop off pretty significantly when the patients present metastasis. And unfortunately, uh, a large number of the PNEDs patients have uh, present metastasis at the time of diagnosis. And the recurrence rate is quite high among these PNEDs. So uh, in the next slide, we asked, our main question is, was if there was a main pathway that was underlying or contributing to this metastas metastatic procedure in the PNETs. And the question we asked is, if there were early changes that we can identify um, in when we compare the localized tumors versus the metastatic tumors. So to interrogate these changes, we use the RNA sequencing um, to, uh, to identify these genes that were differentially expressed. And then we carried out some pathway analysis and principal component analysis to uh, understand the mechanism. And we followed up with also some verifying uh, with using different procedure like immunohistochemistry and flow cytometry. Uh, so um, this is the cohorts that we use for RNA sequencing. We had 15 localized tumors and seven metastatic tumors, and largely um, they were similar in size, in age, and sex, uh, except that uh, the metastatic tumor uh, inherently had more advanced tumor stage. If we go to the next slide, and oops. Sorry. So the first is actually showing that the principal com component on us showing that the localized tumors and metastatic, metastatic, metastatic tumors had a largely uh, different uh, gene signature that could be clustered separately. 
And these purples are identified localized tumors and the greens are metast metastatic tumors. And there were some outliers that um, clustered, for example, some um, localized tumors that clustered to the metastatic tumor. And interestingly, later on, um, we found that some of the patients actually uh, had metastasis, metastasis at the later stage after the analysis. So using these RNA uh, genes that were differentially expressed between these tumors, and then next we carried out some analysis in the next slide to uh, look into the pathway if there was any uh, pathway that was upregulated in metast metastatic tumors. And we found that uh, many of the pathways that were enriched in metastatic tumors uh, were immune signaling and inflammatory responses. And when we also tried to interrogate if there were any specific like cells that were uh, in the stroma of this metastatic tumor that were enriched, and a lot of them actually turn out to be uh, immune cells. And we verified this finding by immunohistochemistry. Um, it, the top row is show, showing the localized tumors, and they're largely uh, very devoid of any uh, immune cells, CD3, mostly CD3 and CD8 mild. And metastatic tumors had more increased level of moderate uh, infiltration of CD3 and CD8 T cells. And these were also shown by statistical analysis to show that metastatic tumors had more increased level of moderate level of tumor infiltrating T cells. So the chemokines and cytokines are key for recruiting the T cells to the tumor. So we investigated some chemokines and found that CCL5, also known as um, Rantes, were highly expressed in metastatic tumors. So the T cells that were found in the metastatic tumor were largely CCL5 positive. And when you compare the RNA expression level of the CD3, which is a marker of T cells, and uh, CCL5, the chemokine expression, there was a very robust uh, positive correlation. So these uh, show that the T cell infiltration level were also uh, very correlated with expression of the CCL5. And the next we used uh, fresh tumors and also blood from the same patients and to identify the, um, the activation status of those T cells infiltrating in the tumor. So top, uh, some of the gray lines are indicating uh, T cells uh, from the circulating blood and the darker ones are showing um, the tumors taken out from the tumor. And we found that most of the tumor infiltrating T cells show evidence of activation. And CD69 is one of the uh, early activation marker that shows that we're antigen dependent uh, T cell activation. Um, the PD1, which is the exhaustion marker, we didn't find that it was highly upregulated in these tumor infiltrating T cells. And we also use the L1000 uh, algorithm to predict if there was any drug that can uh, perturb this transcriptional uh, signature um, and found that vorinostat or triclostatin A, these are the histone diastolase inhibitor. And these drugs were predicted to uh, change this transcriptional signature in the metastatic tumor and also localized tumor. And when we tested on these PNET cell lines, bone one and QGP1, it shows some toxicity. And um, some of the also target genes that were uh, changed by this Bernostat were also shown on the C on the right panel. And we noticed that some of them were actually related to T cell function. So we also use these uh, peanut cell lines and treat it with the Vorinostat and show that the CCL5, the chemokine, um, is actually uh, upregulated after the treatment. So we, and CCL5, it, it traditionally and classically it has been used for uh, T cell, 
Um, but there are more growing evidence that the tumors also express the CCL1 and the solid tumor, uh, the level of the CCL5 is important for the T cell recruitment. So uh, we, want, we are following up this study and to show if increased CCL5 expression is functional and that it can actually recruit uh, the T cell to the tumor. So the summary to show um, the metastatic tumors had more uh, increased level of T cell infiltra infiltration, and we found a strong correlation between T cell infiltration and the CCL5 expression. And we found most of the tumor infiltrating T cells were had the antigen dependent activation. And so our, our main question is if there is a way if we can modulate um, to increase the T cell trafficking. And maybe one way is to use this pathway um, of CCL5, which is uh, downstream of the stain pathway. And the drug that was predicted to uh, affect this um, expression was HTAC inhibitor. So we are following up the study to show if the HTAC inhibitor can actually induce T cell recruitment to the tumor. Um, so as I said, um, this was actually a mentored grant. So I was um, very uh, happy. Uh, I was very lucky to join the endocrine surgery department and with uh, Dr. Fei, who has, was a very strong uh, mentor for me. And um, having this uh, grant actually allowed me to uh, further pursue important questions in this neuroendocrine tumor. And with my background in immunology, I think, and with the growing um, success in immunotherapy and other type of tumors, I'm very interested in if we can uh, also uh, understand the tumor and the immune microenvironment in the, nat, uh, in the peanuts. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thanks so much. And it was great to hear about your work on such an important and ongoing important uh, topic in the field of oncology. So thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Halperin and Dr. Heafy now. Hey, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Chris Heafy. I'm the co-chair of the uh, Scientific Review and Research Committee. And I just want to give a little bit of background on uh, NANIT's research grants. So obviously NANITS was established in 2007. And since then, uh, since 2009, when we started um, giving out grants, we've awarded $1.8 million in research grants uh, to 20, uh, 25 medical professionals, um, really to pursue a career in the field of neuroendocrinology and net disease. So if you're interested in seeing the grants that we've uh, uh, funded over the years, uh, please go to the grant recipients page uh, and you can see that. Uh, next slide. Uh, historically, I just wanted to share a couple of the different types of grants that we um, uh, try to fund. So one is the basic uh, translational scientific or science investigator award. The other is the clinical investigator scholarship. We also do a theranostics investigator grant and a young investigator award. So uh, this year we're still trying to secure funding for all these uh, types of grants. And so in the next couple of weeks, we'll announce which ones we're going to be able to fund this year. Um, and just as a plug, I would like to say that um, I got the 2016 uh, BTSI award and it really helped me uh, really um, start my research career. And so now I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Halperin who is the chair of the committee. Oh. Hi everyone. Um, so uh, while of course we're not saying anything about uh, the funding of the grants uh, this year just yet, coming soon, as Chris said, um, we promise, uh, we do just want to take a moment to recognize um, the really exceptional sort of long-term partnership we've had with a number of different organizations. Um, the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation, which has helped co-sponsor the, uh, the BTSI for years, um, it's been a phenomenal partnership. Um, Ibsen, who is focused more on the clinical investigator side, and AAA and Novartis, especially in the, um, the Theranostic space, um, and I think Novartis very early with the young investigator grants as well. Um, and it's just we, you know, we have long-term partnerships here, and and it's that's the reason we're able to do all this all this incredible work and support these phenomenal young scientists who you're hearing from. Um, on the next slide, we'll do a little bit of nitty gritty, um, which is not my, my strength, but um, so for, for those of you who are interested in applying this year, and I encourage all of you to do it, um, we, we really love reading, reading your science and reading your grants. Um, 
the the plan is for the uh, the grant application system to open up on on the first of May. So you should be hearing about what exactly is available by then. Um, but of course, we don't care about when it opens. We care about when the due date is, which is going to be mid July the fifteenth, um, and that's going to allow us on the committee to do a relatively uh, rapid turnaround with sort of uh, with basically forming a study section and reading all the grants quite thoroughly with multiple reviewers. Um, and then letting the awardees know in August um, uh, about their success. Um, also going to put in a plug for abstract submissions, um, which have a similar time frame, but are going to be due in August. Um, and, and basically, we as a committee will be repeating our work a month later <laughs> as we go through all of those uh, so that we can send notifications about um, accepted abstracts for the annual meeting in September. Um, with a deadline to accept by mid-September. And that's because we hope as we crush the curve, we, are, we will hopefully be able to meet up in Chicago together uh, in November. And you will need time to book plane tickets so that we can all see each other in person instead of over Zoom. Um, so uh, on that optimistic note, I'm uh, delighted to turn it back over to Dr. Fishbein who will uh, lead us through the audience section. Gosh, you don't know how much I hope you're right that we can actually all have an in-person meeting in November. That would be fantastic. Um, all right, well, I wanna thank everyone for their talks today. I think as people are thinking about their questions, please type them in the chat um, or raise a hand and, and I'm happy to call or, or just unmute yourself. Um, in the meantime, I just want to point out some themes that I heard through everyone's talk, which is that of collaboration and mentorship. And I think all of these projects really took a whole village in order to bring them together to be done. And I want to stress the importance of mentorship. And I think what I, one of the things I love about Nanets is the community. And I think this is true for research in the neuroendocrine tumor fields in particular, uh, even outside of Nanets, but it, it really is a strong community um, of clinicians, of researchers, and of patient advocates as well. And so I, I just encourage anyone who might be thinking of, of entering the field, I, I really believe it's such a special place to, to be involved in research. So anybody have any questions? Let's see if there's any hands up in the participants. Oh, we just got a question in the chat. So this question is, um, what are the key factors that the committee looks for when evaluating research proposals? So I will turn that over to the chair and co-chair of the committee. Looks like Chris may have left me standing here uh, on my own. Uh, <laughs> I don't see him. Um, so oh, there you are, Chris. <laughs> Um, let's see if, if you correct me on anything. I, I think that, um, you know, the, the priorities for, for our group, you know, number one, um, like with any grant is going to be sort of alignment with that mission and those funding priorities, um, which, you know, really just means sort of ensuring that the work is, is meaningfully focused on um, improving, you know, neuroendocrine tumor diagnosis, treatment, management. Those are the things that, that the committee really cares about. Um, beyond that, you know, it's it's really sort of the extent to which um, the group feels like they're supporting an applicant who um, you know has a has a clear interest in the field, um, and this is sort of you know part of their their career development. It's really I think a priority for many of us. Um, and and maybe Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, how you think about sort of reading the the science side of the proposal? Yeah, so I think the the science side of the proposal proposal, I think you obviously have to have the proper controls. I mean, I mean it has to be scientifically, scientifically sound. Um, but also, I think it's it's the science, but it's also the applicant and how they might look in terms of having a career in the net field. And it's the uh, mentorship, I think, is, as uh, Dr. Fishbein pointed out, is extremely important. Does the, does the person have a good mentor? Does they have a good uh, mentoring committee? Um, and is this proposal going to answer the question they want, but also going to answer the next questions, you know, two, three, five years down the road? Um, I think we're kind of looking at all of that. And so I think these, um, I, I, I would, I, I mean, these are really almost, some of them are training 
uh, types of proposals in terms of the science, science, but where you're going to get to the next level. And so I think making sure you have the proper mentors, proper collaborators, um, kind of thought about everything in terms of, of the science, I think is, is I mean, in, in whole, what we're really looking at. Great, thank you. We have another question, and right before I ask it, I, I just want to clarify on scope um, because there are, you know, neuroendocrine tumors in breast and prostate, um, which are a little bit different than when we think about classic neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas or the GI tract or lung, or I'll put a plug for Pheopera as well. Um, so I, I just want to ask about scope in case anyone is thinking about these kind of rare neuroendocrine subtypes of, of other cancers. I, I'm assuming that's outside the Nanette scope, but just want to confirm with you guys. Well, I, you know, um, I would never want to discourage someone from applying with good science, right? And, and so what I would say is that um, I think that, as Chris said, we're looking at the entirety of the proposal. And so I don't think that you would find that if you applied with, say, you know, small cell neuron carcinoma of the prostate, if that was sort of your passion, that would mean that it would automatically get get rejected. I, I would never want someone to feel that way. I think the, the committee would certainly take it very seriously. Um, I do think that it would it would likely, it, so it's not entirely out of scope, but it might get um, lower priority compared to, to other sort of, you know, a FIO para proposal, for example. Um, but that's not to say that we wouldn't, we wouldn't read it really carefully. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay, thank you for clarifying. All right, the next question we have, um, I'm gonna ask the panelist, what are some things you wish you knew before applying for grants, nanets or otherwise? So maybe what, what's one top thing and I'll just call on you as I go across the screen here. Um, so Dr. Stroll, you're, you're on my screen first. What's one thing you can think of uh, that you wish you knew? Um, I think this will be very, very basic and straightforward. I wish I would knew instructions and guidelines. Sometimes we think that we know how to apply and we know what should be the, the font size and how many pages um, um, we should have for animal protocol. And then after a few days, we see that our grant, our one is withdrawn because um, uh, my, my pro animal protocol exceeded two pages, it was two and a half pages in, instead of two or the font, like recently, um, this is very strict that when you um, are making PDF from, from the Word uh, file, it cannot be bigger or uh, rather smaller than, uh, than 12. And um, so very, very small details. But then if you really do not uh, pay attention to the instructions and guide guidelines, you are late for half a year because then your grant is withdrawn and you have to apply again. Like very, very simple. Yeah, that's really good. very good advice. Thank you. Um, Dr. Halle, you're next on my screen. Yeah, thanks. That, that's a very good question. I would say quickly two things. The first one is um, know exactly what are the specifics of the grant you're applying for and who's going to be reviewing it. So for me, applying to neuroendocrine tumors, uh, for neuron consumers research, two nanets is different than applying to CIHR or DNIH. For nanets, I have to convince everybody not that nets is the most important thing, but that health services research will accomplish a lot for neuron tumors compared to drug development of basic science. If I apply to DNIH or to CIHR, I have to convince them that neuron tumor is more important than breast, prostate, and lung cancer. So that's very different stories to tell. And the second thing which I, I tried to get to in, in my presentation is knowing what everything that's around the science. When I started, I, I, I thought, my research is great. My analysis plan is amazing. It's a good research question. Why aren't they funding this? And it's because there is a lot around this. There's um, the knowledge translation, the patient engagement, the career development plan with the DNCIS from NANETS, for example. And so you have to have these components nailed down. And there are experts in those areas in your research institutes, there are experts in knowledge translation and implementation sciences that you can get on your team and will help you build those parts of the grant. And until I did that, I wasn't successful. Also, really good advice on both points. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Hope, you're next on my screen. Um, I think the, the thing uh, that gets me in trouble is timelines. 
uh, both up front and in the back end. So up front being uh, don't be a procrastinator and write your grant five minutes before it's due. And I always need to remind myself to get writing early and often, get feedback. It, you know, the most important part about grant writing is the feedback you get from your collaborators. And if you don't start writing early enough, you don't have time to get that feedback from your collaborators. And so really uh, being early and often with grant writing is really important. And then on the back end, projects take longer than you think. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think that's the hardest thing with research projects is a misunderstanding how long it's going to take you to complete something, uh, and particularly clinical projects. Uh, but I think that th those are the, the timelines, both in the front and the back, are really uh, what, what I would focus on. Yeah, really, really, really good advice. Having just written a progress report for year one that happened during COVID, I feel that post timeline. Um, but the pre timeline is super important too, because the more people that can read something um, and give you advice uh, about what you're writing, especially if they're within, like Dr. Halei said, a certain area of the project you're doing, I think that's really important. Uh, Dr. Min, you're, you're next. What advice do you have? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Looking back, uh, I believe the Nanets grant was relatively like short. Uh, they required like three page limit, which can be sometimes a little bit more challenging to put uh, the specific aims, background and some preliminary data. So uh, I think also it has to be compact and you want some significance in innovation, all different sections to be all within three pages. That's sometimes a bit challenging. And uh, for me, I needed also some um, support letters from the, uh, the mentors. Um, so having those letters and asking uh, for them to get you before ahead of a time would be, and I think I also needed like institutional, institu institutional support letter. So, so it's not like hugely, um, uh, it, did, it didn't require a lot of work, but there were small things that you had to like prepare separately, career statements and little things. Um, yeah, so I would just pay attention to all the things that, um, uh, that was listed as a requirement. Great, so I think you definitely heard some themes from all the speakers. Make sure you know the guidelines for each grant, the rules for each grant what's needed, watch your timeline so that you have enough time to get these ancillary uh, items, especially from other people, so they have enough time to do it. Um, and then, you know, working and thinking about how you're writing uh, with the most impact and that being succinct at the same time. So great questions. Anyone else have any questions? I think we have time for at least one more. Okay, well, um, is anybody from the panel or our, our chairs of the committee, anybody have last final words? Okay, wonderful. Well, I really wanna thank everyone for attending this webinar. Um, I wanna thank our panelists, uh, great talks and great advice um, to hopefully the next generation of neuroendocrine tumor researchers. If anyone has any questions, the information about the grants um, is, is on the website from the past and hopefully in the next week or month will be um, on the website for the next cycle of grants. Um, so reach out if you have any questions and uh, we're happy to help and the NANET staff is happy to help as well. And I'd like to thank the NANET staff for, for helping host the webinar too. All right, everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.